If the Doctor was a consequentialist, would it be morally permissible to exterminate the Daleks given the opportunity? That's what we'll consider this time on The Sci-Fi Show. This is the final part of our three-part series on ethical theories, and we're going to finish with the broad class of ethical theories that fall under the banner of consequentialism. Will the Doctor as consequentialist be able to decide what to do about the Daleks? So what is consequentialism? As the name suggests, what is important to the consequentialist is the consequences of an act. That's the primary, if not overriding, concern of any moral act, according to the consequentialist. You might describe it as an ethic of the ends justify the means. This makes it almost a mirror image of the deontological approach to ethics. One of the most well-known systems of consequentialist ethics is known as utilitarianism, which finds its recent origins in the ideas of the philosophers John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham. The idea behind utilitarianism is that you need to define some measure of utility or disutility, and then the ethical is whatever maximizes that measure of utility or minimizes that disutility. What is chosen as a specific measure can vary, but what is important is the idea that it can be used to determine the value of an outcome. Bentham and Mill chose pleasure as their measure of utility, others have chosen the ability to experience pain, and... You could conceivably choose anything as the measure of utility. The purpose of all this measuring and weighing outcomes is to try to place ethics on what's seen as a scientific foundation. If you can measure it, then you can do calculations, and this provides you with a science of ethics. One of the interesting differences between Bentham and Mill, when they chose pleasure as a measure of the good, was that they disagreed over the nature of pleasure. Bentham thought that one pleasure was as good as any other. At the time he lived, there was a simple children's game called Pushpin, and Bentham remarked that Pushpin was as good as poetry, provided it made you happy. Mill disagreed and divided the pleasures into higher and lower pleasures, that poetry, the arts, and higher pleasures were of a different order than more essential pleasures, better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a pig satisfied, as it were. Obviously, these approaches differ radically from deontological approaches to ethics, but in a sense, they're an attempt to do the same basic thing. Like deontology, consequentialists seek to boil ethics down to some single basic principle that can be applied universally, and provide a guide to living the ethical life without all that bother about character and soul-making that infests virtue ethics. There are other schools of consequentialist thought, but they all generally trace their roots back to this classical utilitarianism and seek to refine the original insight and deal with some of the problems associated with it. So what are some of the problems consequentialist ethical theories have? We'll look at some of the challenges utilitarianism specifically faces, as this will provide a good summary of the sorts of problems that can be encountered, and many consequentialist ethical systems that came after the original utilitarianism have sought to answer these objections. The most basic criticism of classical utilitarianism is that the calculation it wishes to perform is impossible, unless you're God. It would seem to difficult to see how any individual human being or group of human beings could ever do the utilitarian calculation seems like it requires omniscience to be capable of doing this. How can we possibly know the exact consequences of an act or series of acts? Without an exhaustive knowledge of all possible futures, how can we choose one act over another? There's a term in philosophy called a counterfactual. A counterfactual is a set of circumstances that could have been the case, but was not. It could have been the case that I had toast for breakfast instead of cereal, but I didn't. That set of events in which I had toast did not come to pass. It seems for utilitarianism to be workable, then I need to be able to know these counterfactuals exhaustively. There may always be one I've yet to consider that might bring about more utility. Without a property like omniscience, how can I ever know? There's an answer to this criticism, and it's a reformulation of the basic idea called rule utilitarianism. This seeks to avoid the problem by avoiding the case-by-case calculation, and instead seeking to find a general purpose set of rules that will tend, on average, to result in consequences that lead to greater utility. This would seem to solve the basic problem of decision paralysis that accompanies classical utilitarianism, but it 
does seem to have the same basic problem that it's difficult to determine what the set of rules should be. In one sense, the task is simpler because every action is relieved of the burden of having to everywhere and always increase utility, provided they do an average result in this increase. But it's simultaneously more difficult because it seems difficult to see how calculating a set of general rules that applies to myriad circumstances and, and on average increases utility is simpler than the original task. <laughs> It seems that some simply cheat and claim that the basic ethical framework we've inherited from our forebears provides a set of rules for which the calculation has already been done by trial and error over the centuries. But it seems illegitimate to simply appropriate someone else's very different grounding and foundation for ethics and claim that this is how yours would work out if you did the calculations. There's also a more serious problem that rule utilitarianism tries to address as well, that utilitarian leads to some very immoral conclusions. In its basic form, it seems that utilitarianism would say that on an island of 100 people, with 99 cannibals and one non-cannibal, the maximum amount of happiness could be achieved by the cannibals killing and each eating one ninety-ninth of the non-cannibal. Seems like an odd conclusion for an ethical framework to reach, but it does seem to be correct based on the utility of maximising pleasure. The school of utilitarian thought that seeks to minimise pain and suffering as a measure of utility does provide a resolution to this dilemma, though. However, this criticism suggests something interesting. Perhaps the whole enterprise is misguided. If you remember an earlier episode on epistemology, there was a very simple way to either maximise the number of true beliefs or minimise the number of false beliefs a person has. You either believe everything you are told, or else disbelieve everything you are told. And this will work perfectly well to ensure that you have either the maximum or minimum number of true or false beliefs as required. But this was defective because the goal in practice is to minimise one while maximising the other. Perhaps the same is going to need to be true of utilitarianism ethical systems. That you need multiple measures that need to be balanced against one another rather than just one measure. There's a consequentialist framework known as desirism, if I understand it correctly, that seeks to balance the satisfaction of desires with the thwarting of desires and attempts to formulate a set of rules based on ensuring that the most number of desires can be filled while simultaneously minimising the number of desires thwarted. It seems for all these consequentialist theories though, there are two major criticisms that are difficult to overcome and are probably fatal to them, or at least going to be very difficult to solve. First of these is the observation that this isn't really an ethical system at all. Moral mistakes are reduced to miscalculation. Was the Holocaust evil, or just a bad calculation? seems to reduce moral wrongdoing to an intellectual mistake, bad ethical arithmetic. Does this seem reasonable? It would appear that consequentialism removes the ethical dimension from life entirely by reducing it to something else. Whatever is meant by ethics, it's entirely reducible to something other than ethics. It's been criticised as being a thin ethical system, but upon closer inspection, it seems that it isn't an ethical system at all. I'm not sure how a consequentialist can deal with this problem. I'm not even sure they would want to. It would seem that such a reduction is actually the goal, to show that ethics is nothing but something more basic. The second serious problem is more subtle, but I think a far greater problem. Good people aren't consequentialists. The more saintly and morally perfect you are, the less likely you are to buy into a consequentialist framework. It's the ends justify the means approach to moral reasoning. None of the great saints that I've seen reason in this fashion. Some might be deontologists, and most are virtue ethicists, but none as far as I can tell are consequentialists. But this would suggest something profoundly strange if consequentialist ethics are the right approach. It means that the more morally perfect a person is, the less intellectually perfect they are because they're moving away from the truth. What do we make of a human nature that is wired in such a perverse fashion? There's an interesting question of philosophical anthropology here, and we'll return to this idea in a future episode. So can the Doctor as Consequentialist decide what to do about the Daleks? In one sense, the decision might be simple. The outcome will be better if the Daleks are gone. Although perhaps it isn't that simple. On basic utilitarianism, it seems that the Daleks will derive an enormous amount of pleasure from exterminating everyone else and setting themselves up as the supreme beings in the universe. Of course, there's a negative set of displeasure on the other side of the scales. So how could the Doctor balance this? Perhaps the choice is simple. I suspect not. 
but that's because regardless of the ethical framework you employ, an act like genocide can never be a simple one. We all seem to recognise in the Daleks a great moral evil, precisely because they're so comfortable with the idea of genocide. Ultimately, regardless of the ethical framework that is adopted, it seems that they all reach a difficult decision in dealing with the Daleks. It isn't simply to decide what to do about them, and we see the Doctor agonise over it every time he is confronted with the possibility. Perhaps the Doctor is a better man than many of us that find his dilemma strange. You can find more information on the different ideas contained in this episode in the show notes on scifishow.com. And if you've never seen Doctor Who, you can find links to purchase it from Amazon in the show notes. I can be reached for comments via feedback at scifishow.com. You can also leave comments in the show notes at scifishow.com, and you can also leave comments on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash scifishow. You can also follow the show via The Sci-Fi Show on Twitter. If you do enjoy the show, please go over to our Facebook page and click like. If there's a topic you'd like me to look into, please don't hesitate to ask. And don't forget, it's fire with a PH. Let me know what you think. This podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license, and the music is provided by Furious J and Maniacal M. The Sci-Fi Show is a proud member of Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award-winning and award-nominated podcasts to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. Learn how to podcast, theorize over the TV shows Once Upon a Time, Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and Under the Dome. Laugh with our clean comedy, interface Christianity with the world, learn critical thinking from movie reviews, and more at noodle.mx.